It was 1994, and something started happening at a church in Toronto. People were falling over, stumbling around, laughing, shaking, claiming to have seen miracles. It was the beginning of one of those weird Christian movements. Ten years later, this stuff was still going on, and that's when Bob Ekblad walked through the doors. He really shouldn't have been there. If anyone had a good reason to stay away, it was Bob. This was not his place. These were not his people. So yeah, I grew up uh, in an evangelical home. Um, went to a private Christian school, first through seventh grade steeped in sort of a God and country, you know, God and the Republican Party family. Then, age 13, my parents couldn't afford to have me in the private school, transferred into a public school and new church full of a lot of kids that were like jocks, like starting lineup, basketball players, football players. They didn't have a time of day for me. I, I felt really on the outside, really excluded. The kids that embraced me were all the kids that were the druggies. So that created a paradigm shift because uh, the people that were supposed to be the them were just amazingly hospitable and wonderful people who I was drawn to. And the us, so to speak, were excluders and I felt completely rejected and was. It was a period of disillusionment that led me to many years of just being outside the church and kind of working out my, my own personal faith, but in the mountains, you know, climbing in the North Cascades, in Yosemite, in the Alps. That led to and a decision to travel through Europe where I heard a guy give a bunch of lectures on liberation theology that were just super passionate. And I felt called to go on this journey through Latin America and letting myself be affected by the context of oppression and poverty. Ended up in Guatemala in the midst of a full-on civil war. It was right in the middle of all that that I thought this is what I want to do for my life is is respond to the, the underlying issues of that lead to civil wars, that lead to oppression. And I want to do it with my girlfriend. So I, I called my girlfriend Gracie from Guatemala, from a phone booth on my 23rd birthday and asked her to marry me. And she agreed. A month later, I was up at home. A couple, like a month after that, we were married and back in Guatemala. Um, we spent th five months in Guatemala studying Spanish and uh, we traveled all through Central America at looking for places to plug in and work. So we went to this guy's model farm and it was amazing. And this guy, he said, you know, if you want to combat the roots of poverty, you have to teach farming. Started with Don Fernando being our coach, our trainer. Uh, we started farming. We chose a piece of land that was exhausted. It wouldn't even grow weeds practically. It was so over farmed. We began farming using these methods that Don Fernando had mastered of uh, farming to the contour, composting, refusing to burn. People began to visit us like daily, serve them coffee and they were like, so how did you do this? And we'd say, we don't really know. Uh, Fernando, you know, go talk to him and let's go talk to him. And Fernando would be like, no, uh, the gringos, they, they're the ones who know everything. I don't know anything. And we're like, no, we don't know anything. It's, the, it's Fernando. Our role became like supporting Fernando and taking all of his knowledge and crafting a course. As we began to farm and visit people, our hearts just uh, became uh, softened and broken, really. Three years, that's all we did is just visit people. We watched the program go from 12 to 75 to 200 to 1,000 families working with us. Gracie was teaching sustainable, uh, like nutrition and gardening and uh, hygiene with Catalina. And that's when one of the leaders of the community said, hey, Roberto, you know, could you lead us in a Bible study at the beginning of every agricultural meeting we have every Saturday? Most of us are Catholics. We know nothing about our faith. And this will maybe soften some of us who are really rough and make us more humble. So I was like, wow, okay. And that's how we got into reading the Bible with people. I shall go first here. 
It's been a privilege to have President Suazo of the Honduras, a friend of the United States and a friend of democracy here for a visit. We've had very useful discussions during which both of us expressed our satisfaction with the positive relationship that our two countries enjoy. The U.S. was doing covert activity activities, you know, funding death squads, supporting death squad activity where they were targeting activists, including Christian workers. And uh, I mean, there were thousands and thousands of people that lost their lives in Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras. We were hearing all kinds of stuff. And Gracie and I would spend a month of every year, um, three weeks back in the United States, we'd go to Washington, D.C. We were speaking out against what the U.S. was doing in Central America. During this whole time, when we would travel in the United States, the evangelical and charismatic churches would always be promoting the Reagan and Bush administration's policies and always dismissing everything we had to say. We'd speak in churches and people would just, you know, would just oppose us. So we were just getting more and more frustrated and feeling quite antagonistic towards the United States. And um, it was in that period, this door opened up for us to move to France and study theology in a, in a Huguenot seminary and uh, were just welcomed with, you know, just treated so nicely by these French Huguenots. And it was uh, there where um, Gracie and I both felt called into the church. We'd been outside the church pretty much doing all this with people outside the church. And in France, we felt called to be pastors and called back to the United States. We were aware that, that the Skagit Valley had a huge immigrant population. We learned that there was no one doing full-time ministry with this population. And so in 1994, we, we moved up to Burlington and started Tierra Nueva. So Tierra Nueva, you know, our focus was the jail and then gang members that we were dealing with in the jail and then outside the jail, and then immigrant families that we were visiting in the migrant labor camps. And we started a Bible study here too and began to meet with people every week and we just built up this ministry. We got this big grant and the first check came in right at the beginning of September 2001. A couple of days after we got the check, 9-11 happened. This was just a, a devastating impact, you know, on our on our ministry. I mean, as soon as 9-11 happened, what we noticed is this flags everywhere sentiment of fear uh, of nationalism and this attitude of fear towards immigrants. We had a lot of people that just uh, stopped supporting us. Around the same time, methamphetamines were hitting our county and a lot of young people and a lot of our people we knew were just being uh, caught up in, in addiction to meth and people just coming in looking like skeletons and losing their teeth. And it was just like, oh man, this is a scourge. But it felt like our gospel was not really impacting that uh, that scourge. And so around that time, Gracie and I just went through a period of just soul searching that lasted for a couple of years where we were just like increasingly desperate. Like we read the stories of Jesus healing the sick and driving out demons and, and just healing everyone of every kind of affliction. And Jesus was putting us in crisis. Like, like Jesus, yes, you know, so beautiful what you did but like, what's up with us? Why don't we see the breakthroughs that we see in the gospels like here in Skagit County? Like we wanna see it. My wife, Gracie was like very burnt out. Catch the Fire Conference in Toronto was being promoted by my brother and I said, man, maybe you should go to that, Gracie. And so she says, well, maybe. Anyway, she ended up going. It was a, a real powerful experience for her. The night she came back, I I was complaining because, you know, I just, my nostrils, I'd never been able to breathe through both of my nostrils my whole life. And so I'd wake up with dry mouth and I was just kind of mentioning something. And she said, well, you, you should go to the doctor and really check that out. And then she's, well, maybe I should just pray for you. I was witnessing that happening in, at this conference. So she reaches over, prays for me. And uh, 
my nostrils like opened up. So I was like, I slept through the night, breathing through my nose for the first time in my life. So that was pretty, pretty significant. So here Bob is on an airplane, headed to the charismatic revival movement known as the Toronto Blessing or Catch the Fire. January of 2004, I flew to Toronto and went with my uh, brother, another brother who's a Presbyterian pastor to this leaders conference. The leader of this movement gets up to the microphone and says, hey, I just want to welcome all of you. And I, how many Americans are here in the audience? I like to invite all the Americans to stand up. And he says, you know, I just want to welcome all you Americans and let you know that not all of us Canadians are against what you're doing in Iraq. Some of us are just really glad that you are the world's global police force. Let's give the Americans a round of applause. Okay, so I was like, oh. I sat down and I was just so disappointed. I'm seeing a guy praying for people down to the left of the line and uh, I'm looking down and I'm watching them falling after he prays for them, you know, being overcome by the spirit. So I'm thinking, I'm not gonna do this. I'm not gonna be slain in the spirit. That's no way. Like, uh, what if I catch some kind of a right-wing Republican anointing or something like I just, I don't want to like lose control to them. I'll lose control to the Holy Spirit, but not to these people. And so I'm just, but then I'm, I'm praying, okay, Jesus, I trust you. And I was praying the Jesus prayer, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner, which is something I prayed regularly. And the guy gets to me and he's this British guy, like 25, barefoot, really humble, just puts a hand in front of me and I feel someone touch my back like the catcher. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to fall down. You don't need to worry about that, I'm thinking. So anyway, the guy says, um, I see you in a circle of men in red uniforms sitting on blue plastic chairs. I think they're prisoners. And I hear the father saying, I love how you love my prisoners. And I was like, whoa, okay, like that's who I read the Bible with, people in red jail fatigues, sitting on blue plastic chairs in the multipurpose room of our jail. That's what I did week after week after week. I've been doing that, you know, for that point, 10 years, and uh, my heart had been broken by it. And here's this charismatic guy telling me that the father sees, loves how I loved his prisoners. That. That got me right in the gut, right in the heart, okay? Then he says, and I hear the Father saying, I'm gonna make your heart burn as you read the Bible, and I'm gonna give you revelation that will make their hearts burn. And that's my favorite scripture, the Emmaus Road, you know, where Jesus opens the scriptures and they say, didn't our hearts burn when he explained the scriptures to us? And so like, that's exactly what I wanted, is to, is to grow in that area. And so I was like, super shocked that this guy was prophesying so exactly. Then um, he, has, he, has, ha, he has my full attention, right? And I feel known by, by Jesus directly and addressed by, by God directly. Then he says, um, and now the Father's saying, he's gonna give you an anointing for healing so that your words will be confirmed by the signs that follow. As soon as he said that, I just remember thinking, no, but it was too late, I was falling and I lay on my back on the ground um, with my hands just on fire, feeling like they were just like burning. That next day I flew home thinking, okay, I, uh, wow, I've had this experience. I wonder what's gonna happen, how it's gonna, you know, how I'm gonna just adjust to my life back at Tierra Nueva. I remember coming home and my head was still like, felt like I had like warm oil covering my forehead. Came home and I just felt like my whole heart had just been tenderized. Like I went over to my dad's house and just asked him to forgive me for holding resentment and told him how much I loved him. And, and I began to experience like every night, uh, feeling God's presence just washing over me like big waves, wake up in the middle of the night, just shaking. And so I had to pay attention to this, what was happening to me. And I didn't know what to do with it. In the jail, um, well, I had a whole room full of guys, like white guys who were kind of 
One of them was a real neo-Nazi guy, big, tall, six foot seven, heroin, ex-heroin meth user, a guy named Zach, and like half the room, like seven or eight, nine guys were all Latino gangster gang members. And I had done a Bible study about discrimination. And at the end of it, I said, how should we respond? And Zach had said, we got to pray for, for Fabiano, that God would heal his effing liver. Fabiano had been crying every night because of cirrhosis of the liver and all this pain. And, and I was like, Fabiano, do you, do you need prayer? I mean, do you want prayer? And he, he was a really humble guy. He nodded. And I knew Zach had a liver problem because his hands were swollen like twice their normal size. And so I said, well, Zach, um, if we're going to pray for Fabiano, maybe we should just include you too and pray for you. And he was like, no, you know, I'm just a selfish guy. I just think we should focus on him. And I said, okay, but let's pray for you too. So he let me, we prayed for both guys. And I, I never prayed for anything like that. I put a hand where I thought their livers were. And I just said, Jesus, I just asked for you to touch these guys and come back a week later and their symptoms had disappeared. You know, they, they'd been pain free. And so that was like really powerful, like to see that in you know, such a humble way. And I began praying for people and just seeing God heal people on a weekly basis in the jail. And then people would want to give their lives over to Jesus, like in response. And I wasn't used to really signing people up, like getting them saved, so to speak, like all that language was, but they were, all the people were wanting that. So I began to pray more deliberately with people by, you know, in response to their requests. In our ministry, God is doing a work where word, you know, the scriptures, reading the scriptures for good news uh, at the margins, you know, for the poor. Spirit, you know, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the moving in the power of the Holy Spirit and street or, you know, justice, advocacy, peacemaking, confronting the powers, standing with the, the downtrodden. Those three pieces we feel called to really champion uh, together in a united way like and we see that the places of deepest brokenness and marginalization everywhere in the world require a united body of christ and and so we're we feel called to a ministry of reconciliation and there's a need for repentance on lots of fronts like we need to repent of all of our judgments harsh judgments against evangelicals and charismatics and churches that endorse the status quo need to you need to repent of that and be about Jesus and the kingdom of God. And so without that happening, you know, we're going to just see increasing division and, uh, and ineffective ministry because uh, the body of Christ in North America isn't going to be trusted around the world. And, and without that, people aren't going to have the tools and the, uh, the mindset and the, you know, the anointing that they need to be able to see the chains broken off of people and the captives being set free.